Father, thank you for this time together where we can rejoice that we are free in Christ, that you have set us free from our sin, the guilt of our sin, the power of our sin. And we thank you, Lord, that we're no longer slaves to it, but we are yours. I pray as we look at your word and the wonderful historical story of Joseph, that we might see you, that we might understand you better, that we might fit more into your plans, that you might help us, Lord, to curb our will to yours, that we might be dead to ourselves and alive to you. Thank you for the worship. Thank you for being able to express our feelings, our heartfelt thanks to you. And I pray, Lord, that you would stir us up by your spirit, that as we read your word, that we might see you and see ourselves, that we might learn. We give you this time, Lord, and pray that you consecrate us to you. In Jesus' name, amen. So we are back in the book of Genesis, and we're looking at chapter 41, which is this long-awaited elevation of Joseph. He's finally going to get out of all of the difficulty and hardship. I don't know if you've had a long string of difficulty and hardship, but it's good when you finally get to the end of it. It's like a gigantic breath and sometimes tears, and it's, uh, it can be a very difficult road to walk. And Joseph has been on a very difficult road. Last we left him, we left him in prison. If you remember last week, he was in prison. And it just so happened that Pharaoh sent two of his guys there. The, the butler, the baker, and the candles. No, the but, butler and the baker. I, I get... I'm hooked on phonics and I also have nursery rhymes on the brain. Joseph's incarceration, he's being tried and it is not an accident and it is not what people coincidence. This is God's plan. This is God's hand causing everything to come into alignment in just the right way. You wouldn't think it a coincidence that the sun comes up every day, right? You wouldn't think it a coincidence that you have a, a monthly cycle with the moon and the tides, would you? No, those things are all designed by God and it's not a coincidence. It's God's providence. And of course, there's a dream. These two men that end up going into jail have a dream. Both of them in the same night have two different dreams and they're disturbed because it's not, it's not any kind of dream like you might understand. It's a dream that's come from God. It's inspired by him. It's sent by him. And it's designed to bring our hero to the forefront, to the place where he needs to be. And so we only see that when we read forward. You remember Joseph. He had two dreams earlier with his brothers. Probably in his naivete, shares that with his brothers. And his brothers say, you know, we're not going to be bound down to you. And then he has another dream. And it's interesting that there are couplets of dreams. And you wonder, why is it two? Any of you wonder why it's two? No, you don't care. Okay. So <laughs> it's interesting because it's twos all the way across the board. And it happens to be two years until Pharaoh has two dreams and Pharaoh has two dreams. So it's rather interesting. And I think uh, the scriptures will reveal that to us a little bit. So he's there and he's captive. And of course, most people in captivity might complain and cry and whine and where is God? Why has he left me? And of course, uh, David does some of that in the Psalms, which we went over last week. But Joseph doesn't do that. He puts himself to work and wherever he's planted, he grows. And whatever he does, he prospers because he's doing what he does for the Lord. He's not doing it out of bitterness and angry. I mean, he could just sit in prison and languish and just sit in a corner and say, leave me alone, I'm here unfairly. But he doesn't do that. He puts himself to work and he takes his gifts that God's given to him and he puts them to work. And the jailer finally gives him the keys and says, here, take care of the place. I'm going to go have lunch for a few days. And he takes care of everything for him, just like he did for Potiphar in Potiphar's house. He's somebody who has a great character and great integrity. He doesn't have to be looked over, doesn't need to be told what to do. He's allowed to go because he serves the Lord God and he does what God's called him to do. So he's being tested as he's in this captivity, whether he's going to complain or whether he's going to grow. And we see that he rises to this and he does well. We see that Daniel also is an interpreter of dreams for Nebuchadnezzar. And we, we see that back in Daniel chapter two and chapter four and, and so on. God speaks to people through dreams and especially in the Old Testament. And you'll find loads of people in who the Lord speaks to. And so 
These guys begin to explain their dream. The cup bearer or the butler says, I, I saw myself with a cup and I saw these three branches and I saw all of this fruit and I squeezed the fruit into his cup and I gave Pharaoh the cup. And, and that's what I saw. And Joseph says, well, that, that's an easy one. And it's funny, he doesn't take time to pray. He doesn't go away and, and consult the Lord. He immediately knows the answer. He says the three branches are three days. The, the grapes that you're squeezing into his cup and giving him his cup, you're going to be restored. In three days, Pharaoh's going to raise you back up. You're going to take your office. You're going to be a butler like you used to be. And so, of course, uh, having a good report, the next guy says, ho, 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 great. This guy's a, a bearer of good news. Here, let me tell him my dream. Oh, I had a dream and there were three white baskets on my head and they were full of bread and baked goods and wonderful things that Dave doesn't eat. And suddenly <laughs> there were all of these birds that came and just started eating all of the, bird, the, the stuff on top of my head and I couldn't stop them. And he says, well, you know, bad news for you because in three days, it just so happens to be the same three days and they had the same dream. Uh, they both dreamed in the same night. And so in three days, Pharaoh's gonna cut your head off and he's gonna hang you up and the birds are gonna feed on you. Not so good news for the baker. And so guess what happens? Exactly what Joseph said happens. And the one is restored and the other is not. But in the middle of all this, giving him the interpretation, we see Jesus, don't we? We see wine and bread, both being demonstrated here. We know in the Last Supper, Jesus said, this is my body, which is broken for you. And we see his blood, which is spilled for the remission of sins. And so we see the gospel being preached way back here in Genesis. Uh, not just in Genesis chapter three, but also here we get to see. The basket is full of holes and it contains bread. Jesus said, I am the bread of life. His body was pierced for our transgressions. And so we see all of the illusion and pointing to the Christ who would come. We saw that last week. Jesus calls himself the living bread. So as we move through the scriptures, we see that the dreams happen exactly as Joseph said. And the butler was restored and the baker had his head cut off and he was hung on a post. So it's exactly as he said. But if you remember, he had a little commercial in there. He goes, listen, when you get back there, remember me. Because I've been sent here unjustly. I've been imprisoned. I've done nothing. I've been captured from the land of the Hebrews. He doesn't talk about his brothers, you'll notice. He doesn't beat them up verbally in telling his story. He just says, I've been, I've been kidnapped and I've been sent here. That's kind of nice. Because he could have spent a long time explaining his situation and making his brothers look really, really bad. But he didn't do that. He says, I was kidnapped and brought here. And I didn't do anything deserving this. So remember me when you get there. And we see that he doesn't remember, but he forgets. He completely forgets about Joseph. He goes before Pharaoh and he's serving Pharaoh. And for two years, doesn't mention a word to Pharaoh about this Hebrew boy in prison who interpreted his dream perfectly. And yet God is in charge of all this. He's allowing all this to happen exactly as it is. And we left it here in Genesis chapter 41, verse 1, that they came to pass at the end of two full years that Pharaoh had a dream. And behold, he stood by a river. Gee, what a coincidence. Pharaoh has a dream. So we saw this, the training of Joseph. He was tested with obscurity where no one knew who he was. He was an absolute nobody. He was a slave. He was delegated authority. And of course, there's responsibility that comes with that. And you either rise to it or fall under it. The test of self-autonomy. He could do whatever he wanted to, and he was just and right in what he did. His sexual purity was tested. His priority as to whether God was going to be more important than his feelings. He, he was tested by weakening because she came to him daily, constantly propositioning him. So it wasn't like he said no, and she didn't bother him anymore. She was constantly pursuing him. And so his metal, so to speak, was being tested, and he passed it. His honesty, was he going to be honest about what happened? Even when people speak harshly of you, he was going to be unpopular because the word got out. And of course, all of the, the men were on the side of their employer. And of course, the insincerity of somebody accusing him of something he never did. 
and having to endure that with grace. If you've ever had an experience like that, it can be very, very difficult to endure. The injustice of being accused of something you didn't do and knowing that the other person is just flat out messed up in the whole thing. It's very difficult to endure. And then there's this unrighteous captivity where he's thrown in jail. He could have been killed, but he wasn't. And we see also this repeated disappointment of, hey, remember me when, when you get before you know, your Pharaoh and he doesn't remember him. And so there's this repeated disappointment. I'm sure just reading through this list, you have experienced these, if not all of them, many of them. Understand it's God's testing of you. It's not God forsaking you. Amen. It's God testing. And so you cannot control every event in your life, but you can control your reactions to them. Can I get an amen? amen. And so we receive those things as if from God's hand, either it has his signature on it and his permission, or he has purposely caused it. I, I'm sure he doesn't cause temptation in our life. The scripture is very clear about that. But he does bring difficulties to try us and build us up and give us character. And if you've been through all of this, you're now qualified for a whole lot more. If this was on your resume, that's somebody you want to hire. So now we get back to the story of Joseph in chapter 41. It begins, and when it came to pass at the end of two full years that Pharaoh had a dream, and behold, he stood by the river. So this is two long years. A.W. Tozer says, it is, necess it is necessary for God to use the hammers, the file, and the furnace in his holy work of preparing a saint for true sainthood. It is doubtful whether God can bless a man greatly until he has hurt him deeply. And have you identified with that? How do you have compassion on somebody else if you don't understand the sting yourself? How do you, how do you have compassion for somebody if you've never been touched by affirmity? and hardship. And God uses all this for our, his benefit. The waiting is the hardest part. Every day you get one more yard, you take it in faith, you take it to the heart. The waiting is the hardest part. That's the, that's the prophet Tom Petty. Yes. For those of you who are my age, so, so much for trusting in your deliverance from the butler, right? In two years, the guy who doesn't say anything, so much for trusting in him. Makes you wonder if maybe this was Joseph's desperate plea to say, hey, I've had enough of this. And yet, putting your trust in another person can be a very, <laughs> a very difficult thing when you trust other people. Um, you might think that you can trust everyone and you don't. Jeremiah 15, uh, 17, verses 5 to 7 says, Thus says the Lord, Cursed is the man who trusts in man and makes flesh his strength, whose heart departs from the Lord. You see, it's a substitution. Instead of trusting God, you trust people. For he shall be like a shrub in the desert. He shall not see when good comes, but shall inhabit parched places in the wilderness, in a salt land in which is not inhabited. It's a little like a group text arriving at the time that you're having a team building experience at work. You know, a trust fall, you know, when you fall back and they do those things in corporate America where you learn to trust your coworkers and suddenly they all get a text and everybody says, you know, okay, hold on a minute, but he's already in full fall. So cursed is the one who trusts in the Lord, who, who doesn't trust in the Lord, but trusts in man. And you're strength is in your flesh, what you can do, what you can accomplish. And it's interesting because the older I get, the less I trust in my flesh. When I wake up and go, oh, and I can't quite walk right for a while, and it takes me a shower and, and uh, some bending and stretching and, you know, bending and stretching is putting on socks and shoes. That's basically it. I don't, I don't trust myself in a lot of my own observations anymore when I used to. And I don't pull the trigger so quickly as I once did. And there's a good reason for that. But it says, blessed is the man who trusts in the Lord and whose hope is in the Lord. For he shall be like a tree planted by the waters, which spreads out its roots by the river and will not fear when heat comes, but its leaf will be green 
It will not be anxious in the year of drought, nor will cease from yielding fruit. That is what we're told if we trust in the Lord, because he will be the nutrient. He'll be the water that supplies us like a tree that's planted by the water. Sounds a lot like Psalm 1, doesn't it? It's very much like Psalm 1. Why are you in despair, my soul? Why are you disturbed within me? Hope in God, for I shall still praise him, the saving help of my countenance and my God. This is David's self-talk, if you will. Like, what's the matter with you? You can imagine him looking himself in the mirror and saying, what's wrong with you? Cut it out. You know, psh, psh, slap him in the face and you can see him doing that. And, and it's uh, Psalm 42, by the way. Why are you in despair, my soul? Why are you disturbed within me? Hope in God. He's, he's the one that's going to deliver you. And see, it would have been good if somebody spoke that to Joseph, but there was nobody there to speak to Joseph. But luckily he kept his eyes on the Lord and probably this momentary cry to the butler and his hope in the butler uh, wasn't something that destroyed him. But we do see that his feelings kind of leak out. And it's very reminiscent of Jesus in the garden, isn't it? Jesus goes to the garden and he says, Father, if this cup could pass from me, but not my will, thy will be done and he sweat great drops of blood. Jesus had his humanity leaking out and his emotions all over the place so we might see them. And yet he decided he wasn't gonna trust in man, he was gonna trust in God. And he made the right choice. And like Joseph, I think Jesus passed the test. And it says that after these two years, it says Pharaoh had a dream and he was by the river, by the way, in case you don't know, the river is the great river, which is the Nile. Where a lot of people are in denial, but that's different. So it, it was just Father's Day. I collect these Father's Day jokes. And Anyway, did you know that the Nile is the longest river in the world? It is 1,647 miles long longer than in South America, longer than any other river is the Nile River. And it's a source of uh, great wealth to those who live near it. At the Delta, which is at the, the, where it dumps into the Mediterranean, there's all sorts of nutrients that come from the water and from the rains and from the higher elevations when they melt, the snow melts. So this is a, a very important uh, highway of life, if you will. And so He's now having a dream and he's by the river, which presumably is the Nile River. Proverbs 21.1 says this about a river. The king's heart is in the hand of the Lord and like the rivers of water, he turns it wherever he wishes. God is now going to superimpose his will upon a godless man who is Pharaoh to do his bidding. And we get to see it in hindsight. I don't know where you are, but looking back, do you see God's hand on your life moving you along yep. to be at the right place at the right time? Maybe sitting in the very seat that you're in. Hearing the very words that are being spoken right here. Because God is God. And he's going to move Pharaoh's heart through a dream. Verse 2, and suddenly there came up out of the river in the dream seven cows fine looking and fat. Whenever the Bible says fat, it's a good thing. For you people. Fine looking and fat. And they fed in the meadow and behold, seven other cows came up after them out of the river, ugly and gaunt and stood by the other cows at the bank of the river and the ugly and gaunt cows ate up the seven fine looking and fat cows. And so Pharaoh awoke. Yeah, you have a dream like that. That's one of those that makes you sit up. So he dreams about the fat cows. You know who that is, right? That's Joel Holstein. It was just Father's Day. I'm, I'm full of father's jokes. Anyway. 
And skinny cows aren't what you want when you have cows. You want, you want a good, fat cow. So he sees, he sees seven heavy, fat, well-fed Holsteins. And then he sees these kind of walking dead animals where you see all of their bones. And now they're all in the bank of the river. And Pharaoh woke up and he slept and he dreamed a second time. And suddenly seven heads of grain came up in one stalk, plump and good. Plump is good. And behold, seven thin heads blighted by the east wind sprang up after them. And the seven thin heads devoured the seven plump and full heads. So Pharaoh awoke. So you ever go to sleep and, and hope you don't have the same dream again? You go right back to it. So Pharaoh awoke, and indeed, it was a dream. And it came to pass in the morning that his spirit was troubled. And he sent and called for all the magicians in Egypt and all its wise men. And Pharaoh told them his dreams, but there was no one who could interpret them for Pharaoh. Like so many places of business, wanted, translator. What in the world does my dream mean? And there was nobody, out of all his magicians, out of all these people, nobody could tell him what it was about. You know what you call a magician that loses his magic? <laughs> Ian. You take the magic out of magician and you, uh, yes. that will be the last Father's Day joke. So that was a week ago. Anyway, so he doesn't know what's going on. He has these dreams. He's very disturbed. And he says, I don't understand what it means. Let me get my top guys on it. And he gets his top guys on it and nobody can tell what it was that his dream meant. It's rather interesting. You guys know because you read the scriptures, right? You're cheating. <laughs> These guys had to come up with it. And of course, they're all idol worshipers. And of course, their gods are going to be mute. They're not going to say a word because they don't speak. So then the chief butler spoke to Pharaoh saying, I remember my faults this day. It's an interesting time for a confession all of a sudden in the middle of Pharaoh going through all this trouble. And Pharaoh was angry with his servants, and he put me in custody in the house of the captain of the guard, both me and the chief baker. And we each had a dream in one night, he and I. Each of us dreamed according to the interpretation of his own dream. Now there was a young Hebrew man with us, and there was a servant of the captain of the guard. And we told him that he interpreted our dreams for us. To each man he interpreted according to his own dream. And it came to pass, just as he interpreted for us, so it happened. He restored me to my office and he hanged him. So he tells him the story, the butler. He's not really a butler. He's really a cupbearer. But, you know, the butler brings up thoughts of Batman for me. But so the butler says, oh, gee, oh, totally forgot to tell you two years ago, there's this really cool guy, a Hebrew in prison who interprets dreams. He did for me, did for him. It happened exactly as he said. Well, this is good news for the Pharaoh who's troubled with this dream and he's really disturbed and none of his very high, well-paid people can help him. And then Pharaoh sent and called Joseph and they brought him quickly out of the dungeon and he shaved, changed his clothing and came to Pharaoh. As you know, the Hebrews grow their beards and they grow their hair. And later on in Deuteronomy, it's actually codified. And you see, it's actually written down. You're not supposed to uh, mess with any of that stuff. And so that's why you see it. Anyway, so they shave him, which means no hair, like chrome dome. Yeah, it's, you know, you're hairless. They make sure that when you go before Pharaoh, you look all clean shaven and everything. So they take him out and, you know, like you just went in the military. And now he's going to stand before Pharaoh. Proverbs 22, 11 says, he who loves purity of heart and has grace on his lips, the king will be his friend. 
There's another one that says that a man's gift makes way for him. It's interesting. If God has gifted you with something, you will find that he has a place for you to be. The gifts he's given to you, he has a purpose for. They're not wasted. And the gifts and calling of God are irrevocable. And Pharaoh said to Joseph, I had a dream and there is no one who can interpret it. But I have heard it said of you that you can understand a dream and interpret it. So Joseph answered Pharaoh saying, it is not in me. God will give Pharaoh an answer of peace. See, he always gives God the glory. He never claims anything of his own. Just like Jesus. I don't do anything of my own motivation. I only do what the father tells me. And Pharaoh said to Joseph, behold, in my dream, I stood on the bank of a river and suddenly seven cows came up out of the river, fine looking and fat, and they fed in the meadow. And behold, seven other cows came up after them, poor and very ugly and gaunt. Such ugliness I have never seen in all the land of Egypt. And the gaunt and ugly cows ate up the first seven of the fat cows. And they had eaten them up. No one would have known that they had eaten them up for they were just as ugly as in the beginning. And so I awoke. You notice he gives us a little bit more information, a little bit of commentary. And so suddenly we understand that the fat cows are eaten by the skinny cows and the skinny cows aren't any better looking. So th there are these zombie cows, apparently. And so I awoke. So being awake never felt so good when you have a bad dream, right? And then he says, also I saw in my dream and suddenly seven heads came up in one stalk, full and good. And behold, seven heads withered, thin and blighted by the east wind sprang up after them. And the thin heads devoured the seven good heads. So I told this to the magicians, but there was no one who could explain it to me. <coughs> this desperation is brought to you by God, the God of the universe. This dream was sent by God to torment him so that he might get Joseph out of prison. Isn't that interesting? Mm -hmm. God uses things like this. And now that you know it, you'll probably see it happen. And Joseph said to Pharaoh, the dreams of Pharaoh are one. God has shown Pharaoh what he is about to do. The seven good cows are seven years and the seven good heads are are seven years, and the dreams are one. And the seven thin and ugly cows which came up after them are seven years, and the seven empty heads blighted by the east wind are seven years of famine. This is the thing which I have spoken to Pharaoh. God has shown Pharaoh what he is about to do. Just to remind you, this guy's not even a Hebrew. Makes you wonder what the president dreams. Indeed, seven years of great plenty will come throughout all the land of Egypt. But after them, seven years of famine will arise and all the plenty will be forgotten in the land of Egypt and the famine will deplete the land so that plenty will not be known in the land because of the famine coming, for it will be very severe. And the dream was repeated to Pharaoh twice because the thing is established by God we have an interpretation of the number two. And God will shortly bring it to pass. By the way, the scripture says that every fact, everything must be approved by two or three witnesses, right? And that's written in the law. So it has to be verified by two or three witnesses. It was sent twice so that you get the point. Peter needed an extra one. So he got it threes of everything. It's interesting how boldly Joseph speaks to him because he gets this revelation and he doesn't have to go away and he doesn't need to spend any time. He's got it. God gives him the interpretation immediately once he hears it and he gives it to him. I get it. The seven cows are seven years. The seven other cows are seven years. But the first seven, it's going to be seven good years. Then you're going to have seven difficult years, but those difficult years will devour the first seven years and, it, and you guys will be in deep, deep trouble. Same thing with the grain. It's interesting because those two commodities are what Egypt still to this day is their number one um, support. 
and the Nile River helps them to do that. So number one, cattle. Number two, produce. Those two things, you knock that out, your, your supply chain is done. You guys remember COVID, right? <laughs> he who kneels before God can stand before anyone. Joseph is bold as a lion when he stands before the, the guy who's in charge of the known world at this time, and he comes right from prison. He came from the lowest place, and he speaks with confidence before this ruler. Isn't that amazing? Because he bends the knee to God. And you can do that when you know you're doing what the Lord would have you do. And so we have a definition of number two. As you look through the scriptures, you'll see that numbers usually equate to something. Like, you know, number seven, number three, number six, the number of man. Um, it's interesting. Uh, two is always like you get a double portion, right? If you're the firstborn, you get a double portion of things. And so there's a double blessing or there's separation. You'll see that when they were, they had twins and, you know, God loved Jacob and not Esau and, you know, the separation. So it's either the separation or it's this double blessing. It's uh, throughout the scriptures as you study it. Anyway, now, therefore, let Pharaoh select a discerning and wise man. By the way, we don't see him working this all out because this is the first time he's heard this dream. And yet he's got an answer for him. Now, therefore, now he's going way, way over and beyond what he's been asked. Pharaoh selected discerning and wise man, set him over the land of Egypt. Let Pharaoh do this and let him appoint officers over the land. He sounds very, very in charge, doesn't he? For a prisoner. And collect one fifth of the produce in the land of Egypt in the seven plentiful years. And let them gather all the food of those good years that are coming and store up grain under the authority of Pharaoh. And let them keep food in the cities. Then that food shall be a reserve for the land for seven years of famine, which will be in the land of Egypt, that the land may not perish during the famine. So Joseph not only interprets dreams, but he's got a solution. He's not just a guy who says, yeah, you got a problem. Thanks for having me. Take me back to my cell now. He actually says, I know what you should do. You should get somebody who knows what the heck it is that they're doing. You need to double taxes. By the way, taxes at this point in Egypt were 10%. <laughs> Don't you wish you paid 10%? <laughs> and so he just upped taxes. He just doubled the taxes to 20%. <laughs> 20, if I could pay 20%. So... 20%, and what he's going to do is bank this stuff. They're going to build architecture and stuff to save the grain for the next seven years. So the people are going to be, you know, saving. Boy, that's, that's a great plan, isn't it? Put some money away for the future when it's going to be difficult. Luke chapter 16 gives us the same principle in the New Testament. Jesus says, he was faithful in what is least, is faithful also in much. And he was unjust in what is least, is unjust also in much. Therefore, if you've not been faithful in the unrighteous mammon, he's talking about money, who will commit to your trust the true riches? What are true riches if money isn't riches? Spiritual riches. And if you have not been faithful in what is another man's, then who will give you what is your own? In other words, if you can't be a good employee, how are you going to take care of yourself? No servant can serve two masters, for either you will hate the one and love the other, or else you'll be loyal to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and mammon. God's got to be first on your list. If he's not first, then he's not. If you're going to serve money, and money's the most important thing, you will be sadly disappointed because it grows wings and flies away. And money talks. It says goodbye. So the advice was good in the eyes of Pharaoh and the eyes of his servants, uh, of which none of them could figure out what his dream was. And Pharaoh said to his servants, can we find such a one as this, a man in whom the spirit of God is the spirit of God? And then Pharaoh said to Joseph, and as much as God has shown you all this, there is no one as discerning and wise as you. Me? Just shanked him out of prison. I get it. I see it. I, I see that you're the man for the job. It's interesting. I'm not sure that he was actually trying to recruit him. I'm not sure that he was actually applying. I'm not sure there was a resume involved. 
All he did was say, this is what your dream means. God's the one who interprets dream. He'll be the one who gives you a peaceful message. And then he said, I know what you should do. Ooh, pick me. He says, I get it. I see you. You're the one. I want you to do it because who in the world would be better suited for this job than Joseph? Because he's been faithful with little, hasn't he? He's had very little <laughs> in prison and he's been faithful with it. He's been faithful with his giftings. He's been faithful with his character. He's been faithful to do that which God has asked him to do at all times. Here's somebody you want to hire. You should hire somebody on the basis of their character, not the color of their skin or the identity of their gender. You hire somebody based upon their abilities Amen. and their character. That was the dream of Martin Luther King. And so he was through all of this testing, including repeated disappointments, and he didn't get bitter and he didn't get angry and he served God anyway. That's somebody that you want on your team. And Pharaoh noticed it. So he says, you're hired. God qualifies the called. Joseph wasn't qualified when he was 17 years old to do this. By the way, he's 30 years old now. It's 13 years of being humbled. I think I needed a few more than that. I think I still need some. 13 years of being humble and learning all of these tests to be qualified because he's now going to be lifted up to be the number two in all of Egypt. He's going to be in charge all over again, like he was over his brothers, like he was in Potiphar's house, like he was in the prison. And he was faithful in each one of those things. He's going to be faithful with much because he was faithful with little. And he wasn't bitter. In Ephesians 2, 8 to 10 says, For by grace you have been saved through faith, and that, not of yourselves, it is the gift of God, not of works, lest anyone should boast. For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. You see, we're not saved by our works, but we're saved for works. And Joseph's been working. And he's been faithful all along, and he's going to be faithful at working from here on. Pharaoh, still speaking here, says, You shall be over my house, and all my people shall be ruled according to your word. Only in regard to the throne will I be greater than you. And Pharaoh said to Joseph, See, I have set you over the land of Egypt. And then Pharaoh took his signet ring off, off of his hand, and he put it in Joseph's hand. And he clothed him with the garments of fine linen and put a gold chain around his neck. And he had him ride in the second chariot, which he had. And they cried out before him, bow the knee. And so he set him over the land of Egypt. Pharaoh also said to Joseph, I am Pharaoh. And without your consent, no man may lift his hand or foot in all the land of Egypt. Hey, Joseph, can I, can I lift my hand? Okay, thank you. Can, can I lift my foot now? Okay, thank you. You get the picture? He is absolutely in charge. It's as though he were Pharaoh, except for one thing, the throne, which is making executive decisions, right? That's quite a promotion, right? And he gets prepaid. And so he jumps in one of the chariots, He's got all authority. He's over all the geography. He's got all the recognition. He's got people running ahead of his chariot demanding that people bow down to Joseph who's in the chariot. Gets him fashioned up, gets a chain around his neck, puts some linens on. And he's got a new ride. He's riding in a chariot, which uh, at those times it was kind of like part limo, part tank, mm -hmm. if you can imagine. So it was, it was not for everybody. But this is where Joseph goes all of a sudden from jail because God said it's time. And he raised him up for such a time as this. 
to do exactly where he is. It reminds me of Jesus. In Philippians chapter 2, verse 5 and on goes, Let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus, who being in the form of God, did not consider it robbery to be equal with God, but he made himself of no reputation, taking on the form of a bondservant, and coming in the likeness of men, and being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient to the point of death, even death on the cross. Therefore, in other words, because of that, God also has highly exalted him and given him the name which is above every name, that at the name of Jesus, every knee should bow of those in heaven, of those on the earth, and those under the, those under the earth. Hmm. That every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of the Father. The story of Joseph sounds a lot like the story of Jesus, doesn't it? Bow the knee, bow the knee. But Jesus is the king of kings. He's the king above all kings. And Pharaoh called Joseph's name Zaphnath Peena and gave him as a wife Asana, the daughter of Potiphera, priest of On. You know him. So Joseph went out all over the land of Egypt, and Joseph was 30 years old when he stood before Pharaoh, king of Egypt. And Joseph went out from the presence of Pharaoh and went throughout the land of Egypt. So it didn't stop, stop with authority and geography and, you know, giving him a pimped out ride and giving him the chain and giving him linens to wear. It didn't end there. He sets him up with a cutie. And he gets a new name. By the way, it means treasury of the glorious rest. If you want the literal translation of what it means. In other words, here's, here's the dude that knows the secrets of the universe. Okay? He's the guy who's in touch with God. Savior of the world. Isn't that interesting? It sounds like the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords, who's Jesus Christ himself. He gets a new wife. Asenath, he's never been married. He's been in prison. They don't put men and women together in prison, regardless of how you identify. So he marries an Egyptian woman. How many of you people have a problem with Joseph marrying an Egyptian woman? They're not supposed to marry outside idol-worshiping people. Well, it's interesting because Jesus is a whole lot like Joseph because he gets a bride, a Gentile bride. Amen. I'm suddenly okay with Azaneth. She's the goddess of Neth. That's what her, mean, that's what her name means. He's 30 years old when he, begave his, he began his ministry here in front of Pharaoh, just like Jesus was. 30 years old when he began his ministry. And he got a new job. He's now going to be an architect. <laughs> and he's going to be a tax man. And he's going to be a coordinator. And he's going to be doing all the things he's been learning all of his life to do. He's now going to put all of that to work in what God's called him to do right here in Egypt. He's got to build these big storehouses, right? He's got to collect the grain. He's got to appoint managers. He's got to make sure this thing runs right. That there's order. And that's a very difficult thing to do. For most people, you wouldn't have the gift to be able to do that. And yet, he's already got this, and God's equipped him because he's called him. So Pharaoh called Joseph's name Zaphnath. It's an interesting name. I want to talk about prosperity for a minute because it's kind of a buzzword that goes through the church. You know, and there are churches that pride themselves on being a prosperity gospel church. That's kind of an oxymoron. The gospel says that you are absolutely in poverty because you're a sinner Amen. and you're broken yep. beyond your being able to fix it. No psychologist, no psychiatrist, no great family, no wonderful uh, house and, and pimped out ride is ever going to change your heart. There is no amount of money you will ever get paid that will satisfy your hunger for the black hole of your heart to be filled with good things. And the good things that you fill your life with don't become good things. That's the nature of what's going on. 
And if you're somebody who is interested in prosperity and you think, well, if I come to Jesus, I'll get everything I want. It's like backward masking of, of uh, I'll get everything back. Like the old songs where you lose your girlfriend, you lose your job, <laughs> you wake up drunk. You know, you backward mask it and you get it all back. You know, you get your, get your girlfriend back. And your best life now. If your best life is now, then you're not going to have a best life later. You can have a best eternity or you can have a best now. That's the choice. And if you're living for prosperity, you will be very difficult. You will have a very difficult life because you will never have enough ever. It's the opposite of thankfulness. I just thought I'd let you know because Joseph has suddenly come into the lottery. You know, some people would be throwing money around, making videos, throwing cash around. Joseph's not doing that. He's busy. He went throughout all the land of Egypt. He's still working. He didn't stop working because he suddenly landed a big goose egg. He worked all the harder. And now he's got a wife at home. Prosperity makes friends and adversity tries them. A true friend is one soul with two bodies. That's from Aristotle. That's his point of view about prosperity. Prosperity is, is something that uh, I remember when we got a pool one year when I was a kid. I never had so many friends. <laughs> Adversity, difficulty, you get to know who your real friends are because they'll come alongside you. They don't need a thing from you. So there's truth in what Aristotle says. Adversity makes men's and prosperity makes monsters, Victor Hugo says. So here are some of the modern philosophies of prosperity so that you guys can weigh it all out and make up your mind. If prosperity is a gospel, then these guys are all in big trouble. Like Mother Teresa, like John the Baptist who ate bugs and honey and had zero fashion sense. Or maybe the Apostle Paul, who was always in and out of jail. Prosperity is not measured by the amount that's in your bank account. Prosperity is whether you're doing what the Lord would have you do. And you can do that and be poor. You can do that and just be content with everything that you have. It doesn't have to be your best life now. Matthew 6, 20 and 21, Jesus says, but lay up for yourselves treasures in heaven where neither moth nor rust destroys and where thieves do not break in and steal. For where your treasure is, your heart will be also. You realize if you get in, the more possessions you have, the more you're risking yourself being possessed. That's why Jesus said it's easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for a rich man to enter the kingdom of heaven because those riches tend to be something that we, we rest on and trust, like trusting in man, which we understand from the scripture is not a good way to go, as opposed to trusting in the Lord. Next week, we'll actually finish the chapter. I bit off more than I could chew today. I thought for sure I would get through the entire chapter, but I can't. So we will pick up the rest of chapter 41 next week, and we're going to look at Joseph's life and Feel free to look ahead. I'm going to ask the worship team to come up. You might be in a period of your life where you're in a pit. Where you feel you have no friends. Where you feel you don't have anything of worth. God has a plan. He might be trying to remove something out of your life. He might be trying to teach you character. He might be preparing you for something way bigger than maybe what you're setting your sights on. If you remember, Joseph just wanted to get the heck out of prison and go home. God had a much bigger plan for Joseph, but he was developing his character all along so that he would be able to do the job once he got the job. If you understand that about hardship and difficulty, that if you've accepted Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, you believe that God sent him, that he's the son of God, God the son, that he came and he died for your sin and that he rose from the dead, the scripture says you will be saved. And if you're his, then Romans 8.28 applies to you. So everything that we go through, God uses 
to develop our character. Somebody who doesn't have that relationship with God does not have that. Everything that's going on in your life is probably misery to bring you to the place where you're going to bow the knee before Jesus Christ. But when that happens, everything else can happen. So I would invite you, if you don't know the Lord Jesus Christ, or if you feel that you're far away from him, it says, draw near to God, and he will draw near to you. Amen. Amen.